Good afternoon, students. Uh, today we'll finalize our lecture series for uh, Art History One. Uh, last week we covered most of the High Renaissance. Today we're going to cover a few more elements from the High Renaissance and we're going to review the mannerism movement that grew out of it. So we don't have as much material to cover as we did last week, but notice, pay close attention to all the highlighted areas because they will definitely be on your test. Okay, so I'm going to set up my presentation screen. And there we go. We're now presenting. Okay, so I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint presentation. All right, so. Okay, this is one of the last figures we looked at. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is Jacopo da Pontormoro, Entombment of Christ. Okay, what is unique about this picture is that we're now in a different era of the Renaissance where we're focusing on mannerism. Mannerism or a mannerist painting, they began in 1520. The style is self-consciousness, not a window into the world, but more of a window into the self, into the mind, where the imagery is more complex, exagger exaggerated, and difficult. It's like somebody's joining the... Good morning, Quincy. Hello. Good morning, Quincy, or good afternoon. Okay, all right, so uh, my share screen is up and uh, what we're working on now is the last part of the lecture for our final exam. And so mannerism is a later part of the Renaissance and the subject matter deals with uh, self, the self-conscious. And it's not a window into the world, but more of a window into the mind. And the subject matter is complex, exaggerated, and difficult to understand. And there is an unstable composition and an unnatural color palette. So let's take a closer look at this piece of Pantarmoro, Entombment of Christ. It does have a very different sensibility to it. It looks a lot more modern and contemporary. We have uh, these sort of pastel colors at work, and we don't have as much emphasis on the background being in nature. Okay. Now, I have some notes on mannerism, which you will see on the test. I'm sorry. Yikes. Give me just one second. I have a very messy desktop. Okay, mannerism. Here we go. It's like somebody else is trying to get in. Let me let them in. There we go. Okay, let's get back to mannerism. What is mannerism? Mannerism is a style. Okay, so when I highlight something, this will be on the test. Mannerism is a style that emerged in 1530 and lasted until the end of the century. It is named at the maniera, an Italian term for style or manner, and refers to a stylized, exaggerated approach to painting and sculpture. This is a image from the Renaissance, the late Renaissance. Uh, this is Joachim of, not really sure how to pronounce that last name, Perseus and Andromedia. 
and we see that this takes place at the bottom of the sea. We have all of these seashells. We have a skull. And we have all of this sort of uh, sea monster imagery. And, you know, it takes on a very much a fantasy sort of edge, the type of subject matter. During the Renaissance, Italian artists found inspiration in the ideal forms and harmonious compositions of classical antiquity. While this reinterpretation of ancient models is famously evident in the works of high Renaissance artists like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, it is also manifested as mannerism, a style that emerged towards the end of the movement. Mannerist artists took the principles established during the Renaissance to new extremes, culminating in an aesthetic that put a stylized twist on classicism. Here, we take a look at this lesser known style, exploring its history and presenting the characteristics that define it. Okay, we covered that part. Also known as the late Renaissance, mannerism is regarded as a bridge between the high Renaissance and the Baroque period. So you will see this on the test, that uh, this, this era is known as the late Renaissance and mannerism is regarded as a bridge between the high Renaissance and Baroque periods, which adopted the subset's ornate aesthetic and adapted it as extravagance. History. In the late 15th century, artists in Florence began to forego the ethereal iconography of the Dark Ages in favor of classicism. This aesthetic approach lasted until the late 17th century and culminated in three subsets the early Renaissance, high Renaissance, and late Renaissance. Okay, so this is very important. This aesthetic approach lasted until the 17th century, talking about mannerism, and culminated in the three subsets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so during the early Renaissance, artists began looking to antiquity for inspiration. This newfound interest would then inform the high Renaissance, a genre characterized by naturalistic figures and a mathematically precise use of perspective. The high Renaissance lasted from 1490 until the 1530s, when the late Renaissance or mannerism emerged. So you're responsible for knowing this entire passage. You could see three to six test questions in this passage alone. While mannerist artists were interested in the perfectionism portrayed by high Renaissance artists, they did not seek to replicate it. Instead, they exaggerated Renaissance principles, resulting in work that favors self-expression over the pursuit of idealism. Rather than adopting the harmonious ideals associated with Raphael and Michelangelo, mannerist went a step further to create highly artificial compositions, which showed off their techniques and skills in manipulating compositional elements to create a sense of sophisticated elegance. Exaggerated figures. A primary way that mannerist artists took high Renaissance techniques a step further is through exaggeration. This will be on a test. Pioneered by Parmigianio, an Italian artist, mannerists rejected, mannerists rejected realistic proportions and instead rendered figures with impossibly elongated limbs and oddly positioned bodies. These stretched and twisted forms were likely employed to suggest movement and heightened drama. Okay, so this whole paragraph uh, could very highly likely be on a test. Okay, so here we have uh, Madonna with long neck. So you see how big this baby looks, right? This is a big baby. She has an elongated neck. And we have the children looking on. And then we have the small, the small man with the scroll. Okay. According to Giorgio Vasari, a prominent Italian painter, architect, historian, and writer, Parmigianio inadvertently adopted this unusual aesthetic while painting his own likeness. So this is important as well. In order 
to investigate the subtleties of art. Parmigiano, in his famous art history book, The Lies of Artists, he set himself one day to make his own portrait, looking at himself in a convex barber's mirror. And in doing this, perceiving the bizarre effects produced by the roundness of the mirror, which twists the beams of a ceiling into strange curves and makes the doors and other parts of the buildings recede in an extraordinary manner. The idea came to him to amuse himself by counterfeiting everything. So this is an example of that. Uh, we now have digital media that will allow us to have this same effect. Uh, I think it's referred to as the fish lens effect. So this is a very important passage that will be on the test as well. Okay, and this is about how Parmigiano was sitting in a barber's chair looking at the mirror and the rounded edges inspired him to uh, make this sort of abstraction or exaggeration. So do we see that on the edges, how the hand is more prominent and, you know, the central figure is proportional, but the everything around it is warped? That self-portrait of part of a Parmigianio, self-portrait in a convex mirror. Okay, elaborate decoration, lavish adornment is another way mannerists pushed Renaissance sensibilities to their limits. While high Renaissance figures did not typically incorporate patterns into their work, early Renaissance artists such as Sandro Botticelli did, inspired by Millefleur from the French Millefleurs or Thousand Flowers Tapestries of the Middle Ages. Botticelli incorporated floral designs into his large scale mythological paintings like Primavera. Mannerist artists, okay, let's take a closer look at Primavera. These are the patterns of the flowers inside of this dark wood canopy. Mannerist artists in turn revisited this interest in elaborate ornamentation, covering both canvases and sculptures in an overwhelming abundance of decorative elements. One artist who took this concept to astonishing new levels was Giuseppe Archimboldo, a painter who crafted per peculiar portraits of people made out of vegetation, animals, and found objects. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm keep going. Artificial color. Finally, Mannerists abandoned the naturalistic colors used by high Renaissance painters and instead employed artificial, often garish tones. These unrealistic hues are particularly apparent in the work of Jacopo da Pontomero an Italian artist whose saturated palette took the rich colors of the Renaissance to new heights. This is the image we were just looking at. But you see, this, this shaded area is pink. His torso is elongated. The feet are too small. Once again, another really long torso. And, you know, the palette of these blues is very... Uh, very, very, very ornate. And you see this, the figure herself has blue that she isn't wearing. It's just her skin. So this is very interesting, the past inter infusion of pastel colors. Okay, so let's get back to our, uh, let's get back to our lecture. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is the image we just finished looking at. Okay, and we covered uh, the Mannerist paintings and when they came about. Okay, so this is a, this is that painting that we saw in the notes uh, by Parmigianio, Madonna with a long neck. Okay, you will be expected to be able to identify this piece. And by the way, this PowerPoint 
is in your files area. Okay, and this is uh, Bronzino, Venus, Cupid, and Folly. So if we take a close look at this, this is the, the love goddess Venus, and this is Cupid. No, this is Cupid, and this is Folly. Venus, Cupid, Folly, and Time. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Dog making noise. Okay, so this is Venus. This is Cupid. All right. This is Folly. And this is Time. Father Time. But look, once again, look at the palette. I'm going to zoom in. We see we have this uh, very, very uh, pastel -y sort of blue. You see this? this, this figure, this darkened figure. And we have this wing. This is Cupid with the wings. But either way, it's a very important piece. OK, next we have uh, Tintor, Tintoretto, the Last Supper. Uh, this is. This Last Supper does not have the iconic sensibilities of, of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Uh, it doesn't have the mathematical, the mathematical coding, even though it has patterns and it's a complex scene and there is some degree of foreshortening by not having that direct single point perspective, you have a very different effect. So this is a mannerist uh, interpretation of the Last Supper by Tintoretto. Okay, this is Giovanni de Bologna, abduction of the Sabine women. Uh, this may or you may, or, if this is on a test, you only have to identify it as an example of mannerist sculpture. You won't be expected to know the title. Mm -hmm. And this is the courtyard of the Palazzo del Te, looking southeast. And uh, this is a example of Mannerist architecture, which once again is supposed to take on a different perspective of the Renaissance. And so that concludes our notes on the Renaissance or the elements that we're going to cover. So once again, when it comes to mannerism, uh, you will be expected to recognize this image, uh, the Madonna with the long neck, and this image, Venus, Cupid, Folly, and Time. And there might be this image, the abduction uh, of the Sabine women. Yeah, and so that, that pretty much concludes our semester, folks, it's been a wonderful uh, semester, wonderful experience working with you all. Let me see. Let me take the share screen off. Stop sharing. And uh, I, I definitely would like to encourage and invite all of you to take the second half of this course next semester. It should be another exciting run of art history from a very unique perspective, one that might be useful to you. So, you know, some of you might consider a mannerist approach to some of your paintings, those of you who like to paint, the way that uh, all of the different elements were invested in. It's a very uh, unique way of seeing. So are there any questions? Oh, oh, I have one more announcement, one more announcement. Uh, and I'm going to post this. In, in your announcements area, yesterday I posted your exam date. I got the days wrong. It is not going to be offered on December the 9th. It's going to be offered on December the 8th. And you'll have, uh, you'll have, it's going to be offered actually on the 7th, with the 8th being the last day you can turn it in. So I'm going to post all of that information today on the announcements when I post a lecture. So does uh, anyone have any questions? Hello. No, sir. OK, great, folks. So uh, once again, if you haven't registered for Art History 2 next semester, it's going to be a great course. Uh, tell your friends.
tell your family who are in school here. Um, Art it, History 2 isn't with you? It's going to be with uh, Wesley Chavis. But okay. here's the thing, though. It's, it, it, he teaches in his own style, but the structure will be very similar. Okay. Okay. Well, wonderful. So uh, if there are no questions, uh, I'll see you all on campus uh, next semester. And uh, if you're an art major, we're going to have a meeting this Friday. So I hope to see you all there. Have a great rest of your year.